everyone, I'm Ashley and today I'm going to be doing my May wrap up. I have, I think, six books and two short runs as well. I have quite a lot of thoughts on some of them, so I'm just going to jump right in. <laughs> so the first book that I'm going to talk about is The Wicker Light by Mary Watson. This is the sequel to The Wren Hunt, which I read last month. This was very kindly sent to me by Bloomsbury and The Wren Hunt is about a girl called Wren who is chased through the forest every year on this warped kind of game. But if the people chasing her found out that she is an ogre, who is someone who can read patterns and kind of see the future in them, then that game would become a lot more deadly. However, she's also on a hunt of her own because she has to find the answer to this ancient secret and kind of infiltrate enemy lines to find the answer to that in order to save her family. I absolutely love the Ren Hun and this one was a fab follow-up. I do have reading vlogs for both of these and full reviews on my blog so I will leave all that down in the description box. But this book is pretty much a direct continuation apart from it follows a different perspective. In fact it follows two different perspectives. While the Ren Hun was only one perspective this one follows two different characters called David and Zara. The plot behind this one is that Zara has recently moved to Kilshamble and within 10 months of living there they find her sister dead but the reason for death isn't clear. There is apparently nothing wrong with her in all the autopsy or the tests that they run. She appears to be in perfect health apart from that she really isn't. <laughs> and so Zara starts to dig around to try and find out what happened and she finds out that her sister actually got tied up with the folklore that's related to the village island place. Thing. <laughs> and it's that mystery that this book follows. Now I said for the Ren Hunt that that felt really quite dark and this one is dark but maybe in a different way because this one feels quite sad and mysterious. Obviously with one of the characters suffering from the death of her sister this book tackles grief really quite well I feel like. It really focuses in on how it can be overwhelming but also all-encompassing but in a manageable way so you do get on with everyday life but it's always there and it's not very often that I feel like I see grief written well I have gone through it myself and yeah I feel like I don't often see it written well but this one just really went for it <laughs> what's interesting as well is that this book kind of forces you to reevaluate everything that you learn in the Ren Hunt I'm not going to say how or why but it just the ride that you go on with this book and learning all the new things that are apparently the exact opposite of everything that you've learnt before is just so fascinating and I especially loved learning about a new kind of magic in this one because the magic in this is much more ritualistic. It is still tied with nature so you know that I love that <laughs> but it really was just so interesting finding out the kind of opposite side to what you learn in the Ren Hunt. I didn't love it quite as much as the Ren Hunt just because of the perspectives. I think I preferred Ren over the other two in this. But I did still really enjoy it and I rated it 4 out of 5 stars. Next up is one of the really tiny ones I read and that is this Penguin Mini Modern by Leonora Carrington called The Skeleton's Holiday. On the back it just says, These dreamlike carnivalesque fables by one of the leading lights of the surrealist movement are masterpieces of invention. I didn't like this book. <laughs> I don't think I like surrealism. I like strange stories but I feel like I need a reason for it to be strange or like the world needs to be explained for me to get on board with it whereas I feel like surrealism just kind of is random for the sake of being random and I'm just like but I don't understand <laughs> and especially as well because this is so tiny there wasn't like enough room for me to get on board with what's happening in the story it was just like here's a lot of really random events that have no explanation read it and I was just like Eh. I think I just discovered really quickly that it is in fact surrealism that I don't like because thinking back on a few books that are surrealist that I've read before I didn't particularly like those either so I think I'm gonna leave surrealism for now but I rated this one star. <laughs> Next up is one that I wouldn't have read on my own accord but this was actually sent to me by a very lovely lady called Emily who used to work for Bloomsbury and that is Toffee by Sarah Crossan. This is a contemporary book which you guys know I don't read very often, but it's also written in poetic form, which I swear I've spent all of this year so far complaining about how I don't like poetry. But I decided to pick this up because with it being written in poetic form, it means it was a very quick read because there's barely any words on each page. And I actually did enjoy this. This follows a girl who runs away from home and on her kind of journey, she comes across an old woman with dementia and their stories kind of end up interlocked. Now I'm not somebody who likes poetry enough to actually go into it and analyse it and things or appreciate it properly but I can acknowledge that the form of this worked really well just because 
you got enough of the story really quickly for it to be an easy story to take in despite the subject matter of it. However, the poems allowed just enough severity for the importance of the story to come through and it really did leave an impact. It's kind of amazing how much is covered in so few words because this goes from present day to memories, it covers different types of abuse, it covers dementia, it has lots of different types of relationships. I will put a trigger warning for domestic and child abuse on this, both physically and mentally, and also there is a brief mention of suicide. I feel like this is quite a heartbreaking book, but also quite hopeful. You do see how the mindset of someone can change through how they're treated in their childhood, and there is a lot of focus on, you know, difficult relationships, but it does have happy moments as well and a hopeful note. And like I said, I do think a lot of people would enjoy it. I rated it three stars simply because I did enjoy it, but it's just not my kind of read. But it was a really quick read and I did quite enjoy it, so. Next up we have Daughter of the Forest by Juliet Merillier, which was the May Mythic book of the month. The theme for May was European folklore, which covers so many things, but this book is actually a retelling of the Six Swans by the Brothers Grimm, or it's also known as the Twelve Brothers and quite a few different names, but it also takes a lot of inspiration from Irish folklore, so we kind of just thought this would be the perfect choice because it merges together quite a few different things. This follows a girl called Soka and her six brothers who are all from an ancient family line and the place that they live is quite secluded and magical and it's just infused with like ancient folklore. One day an enchantress enters their lives and Soka's brothers are actually all turned into swans. The only way that this curse can be broken is if Soka undertakes this seemingly impossible task and if she stays silent throughout the entire undertaking. If she makes a single noise during this entire process then the curse will stay permanent and everything would have been futile. <laughs> I was so intrigued about how this book would work because I've not read many books where the protagonist just can't talk throughout the majority of it and especially with the historical setting that this book has as well where there's automatically more dangers and prejudices that would be against her before she's even talked. Finding out that she literally cannot talk would be a massive hindrance for her and it was just so interesting seeing how that story unraveled. I really really enjoyed this book. It has all the things that I love in a fantasy book. It has a historical setting, political plot line, it has magic tied with nature and folklore. It was just incredible. Now I wasn't convinced for the first half of this because it was a book that's really slow going. The chapters are really long and quite unmotivating and the pacing is quite off because the middle section goes quite slowly whereas the beginning and the end are a lot more quicker paced. But come the end, I just found that I'd fallen in love with this book without even realising it and I was so invested in the characters. And I just feel like no matter how much I talk about this book, I could always find more to say about it because I've done a reading vlog, I'm doing this wrap up now, I have written a full review which isn't up on my blog yet but keep an eye out for it. And I could still keep talking about it and like picking things out from it. It does have its problems because like I said, it is quite a slow book and I almost feel like it's a tale of two halves because the beginning of it is very different to the end and there's a lot of things that go unanswered and just f almost forgotten about which I hope is resolved in the second book. But like I said I just loved all the different types of plotline that were coming from it. I feel like I was almost lulled into caring about the story because it was that almost slow calm pace that I was just like okay I'm taking the story in and then come the end I was like shook. <laughs> One thing I do want to mention is that this book has a massive trigger warning for rape and sexual abuse. It is a really graphic scene and I wasn't expecting it but it left me quite shook even though I don't need trigger warnings. So definitely be wary of that if you're wanting to read this one. If you want specific details about you know the chapter that the scene is in or like the beginning of the scene then you can definitely direct message me or do whatever you want. I did make a note of when it happens so I can easily just give you that so that you can skip over it or something. But I actually really appreciated seeing that trauma because the initial scene afterwards shows how overwhelming and how hard it can be to escape what's just happened. But also this book spans over multiple years and it still consistently comes up because it shows how her mindset is completely changed from this one event that happened. And I just feel like I don't see that in fantasy books that often. In a lot of historical fantasy books it's just a thing that happens, deal with it. And it's not really criticised or shown in full light. Whereas in this one it did keep coming up and you really really see the effects that it had on her. Now I will say that I read a review that kind of goes against this because there is a comment made about how she's not the only woman to have suffered such abuse and I do agree that that kind of, you know, disregards the severity of it. So I can definitely see how that interpretation can be taken but personally when I read this 
I only really remembered the criticisms of it or the trauma that's really really shown and it comes up that consistently that it's not allowed to be forgotten. So yeah, do with that what you will. <laughs> but speaking of the historical background, this is obviously a very patriarchal world, but I really really love the women in it and I'm quite surprised because it would have been so easy for this book to fall into the whole women are oppressed thing and just kind of forget about women as characters. Especially since the main character, who is a young girl, literally can't talk. But all the women in this have their way of being heard and they're all complicated but feel authentic. And it is really the women that I remember in the story. They all speak out against the patriarchy when it's needed or stand up for what's right. And I just really, really love them. <laughs> I could go on and on about this book and like I said I do have a review coming, I do have my reading vlog so if you do want to hear more thoughts on it then I'll leave a link to that down below. But I rated this book 4.5 out of 5 stars. <laughs> Next up is the other really tiny one which is Seasons of Magic by Katie Hu who is a really popular Instagrammer. This is a collection of poetry and short fiction which is inspired by nature and folklore which can you see why I picked this up? <laughs> This is just so beautifully written and it feels really whimsical but it's quite dark and unsettling as well so it just really captures the folkloric elements so well. I did prefer the short fiction over the poetry but that's just a matter of preference. I particularly loved the Persephone and the Baba Yaga stories. I just feel like they resonated with me in a completely different way to the other ones but I really enjoyed all of them and I really want to see a full book written by Katie now so I hope that's happening. <laughs> but I rated this one 4 out of 5 stars. Next up I read the three Theban plays by Sophocles. This I buddy read with Emma whose channel is just Emmy, I'll leave a link to it down below. But this includes Antigone, Oedipus the King and Oedipus Aclonus. And I was just so glad to return to Greek plays because I haven't read any in a while because of university but now I'm going to be doing my dissertation on things like this and I get to read so many plays like this over summer and I'm very excited. But anyway, this play, really enjoyed it. It had all the things that I love about Greek plays, which is mainly just the drama. It had arguments, it had many people dying, and it had a lot of insults, which I just find hilarious because they're so blunt and you just see the to and fro in between people as they insult each other and it's just... it's brilliant. <laughs> if you didn't know then, Oedipus is quite a well-known Greek mythology figure because when he was born it was prophesied that he would kill his father, marry his mother and have children with her, so... As you can imagine, this collection of plays covers every single taboo possible. <laughs> and it's that what just made it so entertaining because there were so many dramatic things going off that you were like... <sighs> I didn't quite get along with the chorus at certain points because the chorus was kind of used as, I don't know, maybe a way to explain what the gods are doing or explain what the city is doing. It, basically they would often just speak on behalf of like what a group of people are doing. And sometimes it would be as simple as, oh, this is what's happening right now. But sometimes it would also go into really lengthy metaphorical descriptions of the gods and like symbols that were associated with them and stuff. And it would just kind of lose me a bit. But that only really happened in the first one, Antigone. So I don't know whether it just was that play where everything was very metaphorical or whether I just got used to it, but... There is a trigger warning for suicide in this because it's a Greek play and... That always happens. <laughs> but I really really enjoyed this one and I think Emma did too. So yeah, I rated this one 4 out of 5 stars. Next up I have another really old story which is Beowulf. This is translated by Kevin Crossley Holland and this is an Anglo-Saxon story. It's one of the typical stories of an ancient hero slaying dragons and monsters and things like that, as you can probably tell from the cover. <laughs> I just find it so interesting reading stuff like this because I have such a fascination for stories that have survived so long, like I'm holding a story that someone made up in Anglo-Saxon times or probably before that, but I really loved reading this. I loved seeing the ties to Scandinavian culture as well and Norse mythology because I didn't actually know that was a thing in this book. So reading the notes section in the back which tied it in with Scandinavian history and Norse mythology was just really interesting. It's only 100 pages but it took me a little bit longer to read just because, you know, ancient storytelling is considerably different to our storytelling now. And also there's like five pages of who's who. So as you can imagine all the names are quite similar and unfamiliar to me so it took a while to kind of wrap my head around who they're talking about and things like that but it was a really easy read in terms of what's happening like I didn't struggle to keep up at all. The only thing that might have thrown me off slightly was that it would randomly skip back to explain a king from three generations ago and what happened with him and I'd be like wait hang on <laughs> what time period are we in now? 
but I did really enjoy reading it and I'm glad that I have read it now because now I understand the references that people make to Beowulf. <laughs> I didn't love it as much as I have done other old stories, but I still rated it 3 out of 5 stars. And then finally, I didn't plan this very well because we're ending on a bad note, but I read The Amber Spyglass by Philip Pullman, which is the third book in the His Dark Material series, and I rated it 1 star. I was so disappointed because I rated the first and second book around 4 stars, but this one just was a complete miss for me. I didn't like it. So before I get into this book, the first book, Northern Lights, is about a girl called Lyra who lives in Jordan College in Oxford and there's this kind of thing happening where children are being kidnapped, her friend gets kidnapped and she goes on this huge adventure to the North Pole to go and find him. There's a lot of magical elements that get involved and it's just a delight. However, by the time you get to this book, it takes a religious turn, which I wasn't quite on board with, because this basically turns into a retelling of Adam and Eve, and I didn't quite understand how that connected to everything, because there's also a lot of science in this, but like science from different historical periods, and how they tried to merge together all those different sciences with religion just didn't quite seem like a smooth transition at all. Honestly, I just feel like this book tried to cram in so many different things that just didn't fit together smoothly at all. Because you would have different worlds and different historical periods of science and religion and angels and witches and armoured bears and then an African king came out of nowhere and then there were miniature people and like there were just so many different things that were trying to fit together to present a cohesive story and it just didn't. Especially because the pacing was completely off as well, because like I said, all these scientific theories would be coming together, but they would kind of be explained within a page of dialogue, whereas he literally spent an entire chapter introducing a new species, going into the details of how they reproduce and how they know that genders exist. And I just feel like the science should have been explained a lot more because you were just expected to get on board with it and understand what's happening. As well with the pacing, this is like a 500 page book and I just don't think it needed to be because the first 150 pages were literally spent with one of the main characters walking and the other main character sleeping. And I was just like, is anything going to happen? <laughs> I did very briefly feel like this book was redeeming itself, but then it kind of just crashed and burned really badly when the romance was a thing. And I'm not going to say who the romance is between or when it happens or why it happens or anything like that, but it happens and it's awful. I could see it building up. Like it's not a problem of it seeming too quick or anything because you really can see it building up over the book. But when it is acknowledged, it kind of goes from zero to 5,000 in 0.2 seconds because you suddenly have all this dialogue about how they will never love another person and when they die all their particles will go together and they'll forever be one and it's just like, stop talking. <laughs> what makes it even worse is because of who it's between, but again, I'm not saying who that is. So if you read this book, I feel like you might know what I mean, but also I know that a lot of people really like this book, so it might just be me. <laughs> But yeah, I just, I can't with the romance in this. It's awful. <laughs> oh God. I feel so bad for just completely slating this book, but I can't think of a thing that I enjoyed. In fact, yes, I can. I enjoyed the audiobook. The audiobook has like a full cast of characters. It has music. It's brilliant. And it's honestly the only reason why I completed this book because I got halfway through it and I was tempted to DNF it. So at least I have finished the series and that is entirely down to the audiobook. So, yeah. But this book is just a no. <laughs> and I rated it one star. I'm so disappointed. But those are all the books that I read in May. I actually read more than I realised, which is always fab. <laughs> Let me know your thoughts on any of the books mentioned in this because as you probably guessed from how long this video is, I had a lot of thoughts. <laughs> Let me know what your favourite book of May was, or maybe what your least favourite was. If you're feeling like having a rant, then leave that down below. But for now, that's all for this video, so I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you're having a lovely day, and I shall see you next time with a new video. Bye!